On August 20th, 2008, Span Air Flight 5022 crashed, killing 154 passengers and crew. This is a computer animation of the Span Air Flight 5022 crash on that fateful day. On August 20th, 2008, a Spanish passenger jet crashed just after takeoff from Madrid Barajas Airport, killing 154 passengers and crew. On first inspection, the cause of this crash was deceptively simple. However, once you dig deeper, what emerges is a story of tragic coincidences and ironies. The crash came so close to not happening at all. This is not a tale about a plane catching fire or a pilot flying into a mountain at night. This is a complex story about a crash that almost didn't happen. This is the story of Spanair Flight 5022. On the afternoon of August 20th, 2008, 166 passengers and six crew boarded Spanair Flight 5022 at Madrid Barajas Airport in Spain. Their destination was Gran Canaria Airport in the Canary Islands, a three hour journey. Most of the passengers were Spanish, but there were a small number of other nationalities on board, including some Germans, French, Turkish, Italians, and others. The majority were holidaymakers looking for a break from the stifling Madrid summer. The captain, 39 year old Antonio Garcia Luna, was an experienced pilot with over 8,000 flying hours. He had previously served in Spain's Air Force, where he had been a flight instructor and test captain. In 1999, he joined Spanair as a first officer and became a captain on the MD 80 in 2006. The reports of his tests, simulator sessions, and line training indicate that he was an above average pilot. However, notes during one training session were written about the need for him to improve his crew resource management skills, specifically demanding that he work on his coordination and rapport with the other pilot. Subsequent trainers noted an improvement in this area, however. Crew members who knew the captain described him as being disciplined, precise and meticulous in his job, and as somebody who adhered to procedures rigorously. The first officer on this flight was 31-year-old Francisco Javier Mulet. He had been hired by Spanair just the previous year, with only 220 total hours under his belt. At the time of the accident, he'd accumulated just over 1,200 flight hours, most of which were on the MD-80. Pilots who had flown with the first officer had described him as a serious and disciplined pilot, who was polite and made an effort to collaborate. They specifically noted how much he loved to fly and how happy he was to have the chance to do so. The aircraft being used for this flight was a 15-year-old McDonnell Douglas MD-82. While mostly retired now, the jet had been hugely popular with airlines in the US and Europe in the 1990s and early 2000s, and was one of the safest passenger planes in the sky. What is especially tragic about this accident is how close it came to not happening. At just before half past one in the afternoon, the pilots called the tower controller, reporting that they were ready for takeoff on runway 36 left. The controller cleared them for takeoff, and seconds later, the aircraft called back saying, Madrid, Spanner 5022, look, we've had a slight problem, we have to exit the runway again. The controller cleared them to leave the runway, and the pilots contacted the maintenance control center in Palma. The problem they'd noticed was that the RAM air temperature probe was showing an abnormally high reading. This probe measures the temperature of the air near the surface of the aircraft. Normally, as a plane or a car or anything moves through the air, it compresses the air in front of it, heating it up. This effect becomes particularly strong at the high speeds that jet aircraft travel at. At cruise speed, for example, this generally leads to a 30 degree centigrade increase in temperature. Planes need to measure this temperature for two main reasons. The first is so that pilots can decide whether to turn off the anti-icing heat in flight. The leading edges of the wings are naturally heated by all of the air compressing in front of them as they fly. For this reason, a fault in the ram air temperature sensor doesn't really matter if there's no icing expected. However, the second reason planes need to measure this temperature involves the autopilot, specifically the autothrottles. If the ram air temperature sensor senses a high temperature, this implies that the plane is moving fast, which implies that damage will be done to the inside of the engine unless the engine power is reduced. In other words, high ram air temperature means low engine throttle, which is not very helpful during takeoff, and autothrottles are generally used on takeoff in passenger jets. This means that takeoffs must be done in manual mode when the sensor is inoperative. It is likely that the Spanner pilots were unsure about whether it was safe to take off with this faulty sensor, given its role in something as vital as engine thrust. As such, they decided to return to the gate to have the system inspected. Ironically, the rat probe itself is fitted with a heating element, so it doesn't freeze over when trying to measure the temperature of the surrounding air. If this heating element is turned on while the plane is on the ground, the sensor naturally produces a falsely high temperature reading. While still taxiing, the captain used his mobile phone to call the maintenance control center in Palma. Suspecting that the ram air temperature probe was receiving an unexpected electrical current, the maintenance control center recommended that the crew reset the Z29 circuit breaker, which supplies electrical power to the rat heating element. The crew did this, but the temperature of the probe did not fall. The pilots taxied the aircraft back to the gate to have it inspected by maintenance engineers. The crew discussed a number of possibilities with the technicians which they hoped would reduce the temperature of the ram air temperature probe, 
even including using dry ice to cool the probe. The cockpit was a hive of activity at this time, with people entering and leaving, including the crew, maintenance technicians, the purser, and another spanner captain who was travelling on the aircraft. The captain remarked on their significant delay and noted that they had to log everything that had occurred. Pressure was building inside the cockpit to get the plane back to the runway as quickly as possible. On top of this, the temperature inside the aircraft was rising. It was 30 degrees centigrade outside, and the aircraft was not capable of cooling the cabin sufficiently. Passengers and crew alike began to get angsty and eager to go. The engineers spent over an hour trying to fix the faulty sensor, but ultimately they proposed that the crew simply pull the circuit breaker so as to disconnect the electrical supply to the ram air temperature probe heater. The captain agreed and the crew began to make preparations for departure. A spanner flight attendant was seated in the jump seat behind the pilots and was discussing the faulty sensor with the first officer. Meanwhile, the plane was starting to be refuelled. At just after 2pm, the captain exited the aircraft to personally oversee the refuelling operation to ensure that it was proceeding quickly. Because the plane had returned to the gate and shut off its engines, the pilots had to begin as if this were a new flight. This meant contacting air traffic control to request clearance to fly to Las Palmas. The first officer initially called the wrong controller by mistake, as he had left the last frequency set on the radio without preparing the cockpit for flight. This is indicative of the rushed atmosphere inside the cockpit at the time. It is exactly in abnormal situations like this when pilots need to adhere most rigorously to procedures. There is further evidence recorded in the cockpit voice recorder that the captain felt under time pressure when the pilots went through the before start checklist. As the first officer read out the items on this checklist, the captain anticipated the items ahead of time, saying his responses before the first officer got to the respective part of the checklist. Before taxiing, the captain also called air traffic control to determine whether there was any delay on air traffic control's part. It was the first officer's job to handle the radios, yet the captain was doing this for him. After starting the engines, the crew did the after start checklist. A total of eight items were read, but upon reaching the final item, flaps and slats, the captain interrupted the first officer before he could read it, to ask him to request taxi permission from air traffic control. The pilots never returned to complete the final item on the after start checklist. This was a mistake, but it was one of a number of opportunities the pilots would have to configure the flaps correctly between now and takeoff. As the pilots started taxiing towards the runway, they went through the taxi checklist. This included an item which involved the pilots checking the indicating light for the automatic reserve thrust system. This light should be on, indicating that additional automatic thrust is available if there is an engine failure on takeoff. If the slats are not configured for takeoff, however, this light does not illuminate. In this case, the light was off, but the pilots did not notice this. On this same checklist, there is yet another chance for the pilots to see that they have not set the flaps for takeoff. The last item is the so-called takeoff briefing, which has the pilots review the takeoff speeds, thrust, and flaps, among other things. The cockpit voice recorder revealed that this item had not been done. They continued making conversation with the flight attendant in the jump seat during their taxi to the runway, most of which was not pertinent to the flight itself. Lastly, and most confusingly for investigators, as the aircraft was lining up with the runway, the first officer made a final check, known as the takeoff imminent checklist. He could be heard reviewing the position of the centre of gravity and the flap wheel position, as well as the flaps and slats indicator on the LCD screen. The cockpit voice recorder picked up the first officer saying, flaps 11, despite the fact that the flaps had not been set to 11, and that they would have read zero both on the LCD display and on the flap wheel itself. Investigators would later conclude that a phenomenon known as expectation bias was at work here. The first officer expected the flaps to be in the positions which he called out, and didn't truly look at his instruments to disconfirm this. There is a natural tendency in humans to look without seeing, leading us to see only what we expect to see. In addition to this, expectation bias is more common when psychological conditions are unfavourable, as was the case in this flight, with the time pressure and high workload that the pilots were operating under. The captain was supposed to be monitoring as the first officer carried out these tasks, but because he was lining up with the runway at the time, his attention would have been directed outside the plane. From this point on, there is really nothing to stop the crash, apart from a last line of defence known as the takeoff warning system, or TAUS. This system sounds an alarm when pilots apply takeoff thrust despite the aircraft not being configured for takeoff, say for example if the flaps haven't been set. For reasons we'll return to, this alarm never sounded. The takeoff run was normal, and when the aircraft reached 157 knots, the first officer brought the plane into the air. As soon as the aircraft became airborne, however, the stall warning and stick shaker activated. The aircraft banked 32 degrees to the right and continued pitching up, barely climbing to 40 feet above the runway. The first officer initially suspected that an engine had failed and reduced the engine thrust. However, immediately after this, he pushed the throttles to their full forward stop. This did no good, however, and the plane began to descend, impacting tail first and sliding along the ground. It continued across an embankment and ploughed into the opposite side, bursting into flames. All of this, from the time of liftoff to the explosion, 
happened in just over 10 seconds. Of the 172 passengers and crew on board, just 18 survived. It was Spain's worst air accident in 25 years. Experts with Spain's Civil Aviation Accident and Incident Investigation Commission began piecing together why Spanair Flight 5022 failed to become airborne. The central question faced by the inquiry was therefore simple, but baffling. How could two well-trained pilots flying for a Star Alliance airline with a perfect safety record simply forget to extend the flaps? Unfortunately, this was far from the first time a crash like this had happened. In almost an identical incident in 1987, Northwest Airlines Flight 255, another MD-82, crashed on takeoff from Detroit, Michigan, killing 154 of the 155 on board, as well as two on the ground. One year later, 14 people were killed when Delta Airlines Flight 1141, a Boeing 727, crashed on takeoff from Dallas, Texas, for the exact same reason. Similar crashes also befell a Boeing 737 in Buenos Aires in 1999, killing 65, and a Mandela Airlines Boeing 737 in Medan, Indonesia in 2005, killing 149. Now the same age-old error had claimed another 154 lives in Madrid. The forensic evidence shows that the toes or the takeoff warning system failed to warn and was a significant point failure from the nose gear sensor, wiring and connectors to relay R2.5. This vulnerability had actually been recognized 20 years earlier by McDonnell Douglas, the now defunct manufacturer of the MD-80 series. Following the 1987 crash of Northwest Airlines Flight 255, in which the takeoff configuration warning horn also did not sound, McDonnell Douglas urged all MD-80 operators to conduct the toes check before every flight, not just the first flight of the day. So what's so important about this TOES or takeoff warning system anyway? Simple, aircraft engineers design aircraft to not only fly as safely as possible using state-of-the-art technology, but they also figure in common mistakes that pilots make to provide a backup protection plan, just like the takeoff warning system, TOES, to prevent the potential loss of aircraft and or life. The realistic truth is that pilots are human and were actually forgetting the flaps all the time and the toes was regularly bailing them out. The obvious conclusion to be drawn from this was that the toes is in fact a safety critical system which deserves to be held to a high standard of mechanical reliability. Today, for the first time ever on national TV, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in this special edition of the Insider Exclusive Justice in America, the Span Air Flight 5022 disaster. On location in Beaumont, Texas at the Brent Kuhn and Associates law firm with Brent Kuhn, founder and Pappy Papadakis, consulting attorney who is also a former naval pilot, Delta Airlines captain, and a well-known airline accident investigation expert that is representing the victims of this crash. The evidence clearly shows that the true libel party in this tragic Span Air crash is Boeing. And the direct cause of the crash was the defective design and manufacturing of the TOES warning system. Brent Kuhn and Associates law firm investigators have found that what conveniently seemed on the surface to everyone else to be a simple case of pilot error actually revealed several known systemic deficiencies which made the crash possible. Many of these deficiencies have been identified after the two U.S. crashes in 1987 and 1988 but while lessons have been learned in America, their application in Europe was spotty at best, leaving gaps in the safety net which could and should have been filled. The evidence discovered by Brent Kuhn and Associates as Brent and Pappy unequivocally show that Boeing knew Span Air was using the improper checklist. Boeing knew that the checklist Span Air was using 
were identical or substantially similar to the defective Northwest Airlines 255 crash checklist. Boeing remained silent about this operational error. Boeing instead gave Span Air high grades in its operation of checklists and its cockpit resource management. Boeing conducted this training and operational audit in November 2007, just eight months before this tragic accident. Boeing safety training expert observed Span Air training sessions in simulators as well as in actual cockpit observer flights. In this two-week audit, the Boeing safety training person observed operational cockpit line flights as well as simulator flights in both MD-80 series and B-717 aircraft. Boeing failed to warn Span Air of the deficient checklist and procedures. Boeing failed to fix the MD-80 series defects, which were known since 1988, because they said it was impossible. They failed to retrofit any fixes that would have complied with the NTSB recommendations. But a former Northwest Airlines Master Avionics Chief and Instructor, Mr. Rodney Peters, is ready to testify in court that he designed and manufactured and installed a fix for Northwest Airlines 7 MD-82s. The defect was fixed inexpensively, quickly, and reliably. No other airline fixed their aircraft, and Span Air's lawyers suppressed this safety fix evidence. Brent and Pappy will also explain the legal challenges in trying this case. The manufacturer has changed its name through business mergers from Douglas Aircraft to McDonnell Douglas to Boeing. This case is ready to go to trial in Madrid, Spain in January 2024 utilizing Spanish courts and presumably Spanish law exactly 37 years after Northwest Airlines 255 crashed and 16 years after Span Air crashed. At this time, MD-80s have been retired from service in much of the world and few airlines equipped with early generation takeoff warning systems remain. Today, the crash of Span Air Flight 5022 holds several important qualifiers which give it enduring significance. It remains the last fatal crash of an airliner in Spain, the last crash of an airliner due to failure to deploy the flaps, and the last fatal crash of a passenger jet in the European Union. Brent and Pappy have earned reputations as unyielding trial lawyers who repeatedly represent individuals and families against big companies in the Goliaths of the world and repeatedly win. The lessons learned from the Span Air Flight 5022 crash are a testament to the excellent investigative work that Brent Kuhn Law Firm performs and continues to do so each and every day. They are dedicated to uncovering the hidden catastrophic factors that put our fellow citizens at risk and wreak havoc on an important sector of our economy. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Beaumont, Texas. It is my great pleasure to introduce Brent Kuhn and Pappy Papadakis. Welcome to the show. Good to see you again, Steve. Thanks. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your law firm, Pappy. Well, my law firm is basically a group of people called Air Laws, and we're not really a law firm. We're an association of lawyers that specialize in aviation accident and aviation safety things. I'm currently employed as a contract employee for the Brent Kuhn firm in Beaumont, Texas, and spend all, approximately 100% of my time working with Brent. Okay, and your background is you were a naval aviator, correct? And then a commercial pilot, and then in your spare time, you got a law degree, right? Yes, sir. Basically, yes. And you've investigated or have been involved with the investigations of many, many different crashes, right? I think I could tell you truthfully that it's in greater number than 450 over the last uh, 
50 years uh, where I've either investigated, uh, evaluated, or litigated, helped litigate those cases. Yes, sir. Today we are here talking about a case you guys have been involved with for some time, Span Air, happened in Spain. Brent, what happened in this case? Yeah, well, the, the reason this is such a unique case is that it's been almost 15 years since it happened, and we're still out from trial. And it may never go to trial. We're set again next year. But the frustrating issues in this case is that there's, there's a target fence Boeing. It was a Boeing-owned plane that crashed. It crashed because there were things that could have been done to the plane from a safety standpoint that Pappy will elaborate more on that weren't done that resulted in this crash. We sued Boeing for that here in the United States where Boeing does business, where their principal operations are, in their own backyard. And they went to our courts here and told them that they wanted to go to Spain, where the people lived. Now, I can tell you from doing thousands of cases, no defendant ever wants to leave their backyard and go to the backyard of the plaintiffs and, and, get, and give away what would be called home field advantage. And yet they did it here. The reason they did it well, it's not because they wanted to be fair and, and put it over there where the people wouldn't have to travel to the United States since the plane crash was in um, Spanish territories and it was all Spanish families. They wanted to go there because they thought they could manipulate the legal system there better because there were some concerns under the law there about what are called immunities and caps. And they've been arguing the benefit of those caps, caps on damages where they don't have to pay much, if anything, for the damages. So while they told our courts here with a straight face, that we can go to Spain, they're happy to go to Spain, that everybody will get fair justice there. They have to make those representations that in order to transfer out of the country to another country, away from where we filed suit for them, that those people would not be deprived their ability to, to proceed. And that was a half lie because they can proceed, but they can't get full justice or at least it's going to be much harder. And that's the things we've been arguing for for, for over a decade now. Don't you have a a trial scheduled in January of 2024? Again, this is probably the 10th time we've had a trial date. When you say against Boeing, Boeing ended up buying a bunch of different companies. One of them was McDonnell Douglas, correct? And this is a DC-9, correct? A modified DC-9 uh, to be called a McDonnell Douglas 82 and 83 series airplane. Yes, sir. When you say modified, what's the difference between a DC-9 and an MD-80 or 82? Well, the DC-9 started out as a small twin-engine airplane that carried about 50 passengers. Basically, it's been stretched and modified, where now it carries about 150 passengers and is more than twice as heavy. So there's been a progression over the years, changing it and modifying it, and making it bigger to carry more passengers and more load. That plane does not fly anymore, does it? The DC-9s? The DC-9s may fly in outback countries other than the United States. It doesn't, the DC-9s, to my knowledge, do not fly in any capacity in the United States now. Yeah, just curious, I used to fly on DC-8s with Flying Tigers. You remember Flying Tiger? Bob Prescott, right? Um, what's the difference between a DC-8 and a DC-9 in terms of the cargo it can carry? Well, the DC-8 was a giant airliner it, in its time, uh, came out in the late, in the 60s, four jet engines instead of two, at least two or three times as big. Um, a 707 kind of. That was its competition. The Boeing produced the 707 and the DC-8 was McDonnell Douglas's answer. It was a troop carrier for troops going to Vietnam. That and, uh, believe it or not, Pan Am, you know, they had contracts with the government to give... Continental, a lot of airlines did. In fact, Delta did, had some military contracts. We have, in the beginning of this show, we've shown an animation of what actually happened. In essence, Brent, this is a product defect case, isn't it? Yes. Tell us what was the defective product, because from my understanding, the equivalent of the FAA in Spain has said this is pilot error. Yes, there's, there's a component of pilot error here with the airline that was operating. In other words, the pilots weren't operating it properly. But really, this is a defective part that McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, that inherited all of these uh, liabilities, knew that they should fix, but they didn't, right? Right. The, and I'll have uh, Pappy elaborate on it, but the basic deal is that with, with all of these airplanes, 
And with cars and everything else that you can move around, you have to take into account there's going to be, uh, there'll be issues with the, uh, the weather and the environment and the operation of the, of the, the motorized plane, cars, or whatever, by, by whoever's behind the wheel uh, in, in any given situation. So you try to factor in issues associated with operator air and weather conditions and stuff when you build things that move around. And with this airplane, you, you know that pilots are going to make air. Have you seen the dashboard? Everybody's seen what the control panels look like in an airplane. There's thousands of gauges, knobs, and switches. So it's pretty easy, even operating off a checklist, to miss something. So you try to weed out the errors that could cause a catastrophic deal by having alarm systems and having overrides so that a pilot can't do some things that are fundamental uh, in the operation of a vehicle, same with a car, or you could do something wrong and it result in uh, a failure that would then put many lives at risk. And in this case, Pappy, going to the details of what it was with the tow system. You have flown this airplane before, have you? Uh, I've flown in the cockpit of it. I've flown the simulator of it. I've flown similar airplanes with similar systems. So what was the problem with this plane? Well, this one was the checklist requires for takeoff. It's called configuring your airplane correctly for takeoff. And you need trim in a certain position. Uh, you need the flaps in a certain position. You need to have the rudder in a certain position, and you have to have all the engines running. And strangely enough to say this, you even have to be sure that the parking brake has been released. Then you're ready to take off if all of these things have been positioned correctly. And in this case, the pilots did not, in the Spanair case, the pilots did not position the flaps correctly. And the flaps allow you to take off and fly at a slower airspeed than later when your wing flaps are up and you're at high speed. And the system, the warning system, has been designed to warn the pilot that one or more of these positioning systems that need to be correctly positioned has been mispositioned or it isn't working, then a great big alarm will go off with flashing red lights and loud horns and so on and so forth in order to alert the pilot, my gosh, you've made a mistake. And this is very, very important because pilots are human beings and you and I know that human beings make mistakes regularly. And that's what the company was supposed to do, have a working system to alert the pilot that something was wrong. And it didn't work. It, this one did not work. Are you the only law firm that's representing the passengers right now? Right. Is that, how many were killed? 150 or something like that? All the passengers, it was 150 capacity. Not all of them. There were survivors, and we represent some of the survivors, so they weren't all killed. There were a lot of them that were killed, a lot of them that were injured bad. We represent some of both. There were a few other law firms that represented some of the other families and settled with the company that was the, uh, the owner-operator of the airplane at the time. Uh, we were the only one that really went after the manufacturer uh, with our, our deeper understanding and appreciation of where the manufacturer failures occurred. And we had some very unique knowledge there from a preceding incident that Pappy was aware of involving another MD uh, plane that had been retrofitted. What was that preceding? The preceding airplane was uh, crash was called Northwest Airline 255. It crashed in the summer of 19, fall of 1987 in Detroit, Michigan. And there was a big United States government investigation of that accident. Same plane, same type of plane, same problem. Same type of plane, and the pilots made the same mistake of failing to configure the flaps correctly, and the failure, the takeoff warning system failed to operate in that case as well. Which is what we call the tow system, takeoff warning system. What was the end result of the of the lawsuit against? The airline. In that case, the earlier case, Northwest 255 went to trial and the manufacturer prevailed and 
put the blame on the Northwest pilots solely. That was the end result. That was the end result of that case. Despite the fact that it was a, a defective warning system. It was a defective warning system in the sense that the, it was called a central air warning system, which includes the takeoff warning system, uh, failed to operate. And it was failed in a sense, broken. And it didn't enunciate its own failure by turning on a central air warning system warning light, which it should have. And the defense in that case said, well, the pilots, had they put the flaps down, the airplane would have flown normally. There was nothing wrong with the flaps. Was this appealed? It was appealed and uh, it ended in the same fashion with a verdict for the manufacturer. But the takeaway from that was that it was a lesson learned within the industry. So they did go back as a result of that case and initiate a pattern of retrofitting planes so that it didn't happen in the future. But they didn't do it with this plane, and they should have. I see. So they were well aware. They were aware from this incident from the 1980s. And it's, it's unconscionable that after they knew that, and the FAA and their government agencies got involved, that the industry went back and said, we will fix this problem so that we don't address it in the future. It'll be an override on this particular pilot air. And yet they didn't do it to this airplane. Northwest 255 accident, the recommendation of the National Transportation Safety Board was to fix the, pro the problem with the takeoff warning and cause system. The manufacturer at the time told the FAA, a distinguished gentleman named Mr. Holt, that it was impossible to fix or it would be too costly to fix. And the government had already certified the airplane as being safe. So they respectfully said, we're not going to try to fix it. And that occurred in the, basically the spring of 1988. And simultaneously at the Northwest Airlines, a mechanic said, well, I can fix it simply. And he undertook a fix and retrofitted it into their 13 or so remaining airplanes. It worked good, lasted a long time, was completely reliable fixed the problem, and the manufacturer knew about the existence of that fix and that man, and still they didn't bother to fix the remaining fleet or the fleet that was still to be built. Well, I, I find it amazing that just because something is certified that they don't have to recertify it when n new developments happen which show that it's unsafe. And so I see that the FAA is culpable too, right? Well, that may well be part of the reason that they didn't force the issue there. They thought that the, perhaps, I'm speculating now, perhaps the upper level of the FAA thought, well, if we admit that it's defective, we're the ones that certified it as safe. Maybe we would be responsible. So let's just cover it over and forget about it. Most important is if you're aware of these kinds of problems with your plans, even if it's after, after knowledge that's derived from another accident. So we didn't really ever see this as a problem. So we didn't address that problem. Pops aren't going to take off with the flaps in the wrong position. Well, yes, they do. And they did. And so they said, well, now that we realize that that level of operator error occurs, we need to take that operator error out. You can engineer out foreseeable operator errors. When these operators make that kind of error, lots of people die. This isn't something where you did something wrong in your car. Maybe you put your own life in your hands. You're putting hundreds of other people's lives in your hands. So it's even more important to address these known and knowable issues. And then the other one is with older planes and older equipment, they all get uh, they all get mothballed. And so once you're mothballed, it's not a concern because you keep up with the new technology. But with some of these planes, they keep them in the air a long time. And a lot of times they end up, as they get out of service and don't comply with American regulations anymore and safety, they then farm them out to other countries that do not have as rigid of a standard. And that's what happened to this fleet. So they go out, of, out to another country, to Spain, 
to a secondary market and operate there. And the manufacturers here say, it's not our problem anymore. This lemon car, we just offloaded it on some dumb ass over here. They do the same thing with airplanes. We've offloaded it to somebody over here that, that doesn't appreciate these risk factors and off they go. I will say one thing. Do you agree that the FAA has, Travel by airplane today is becoming much more safer, safer than it ever has been before. Well, the, the airline travel of the last 30 or 40 years has been significantly safer than traveling by a car. For instance, I, this was a statistic I had looked up specifically, to travel between here and Los Angeles by car or by airplane your chances of arriving alive in Los Angeles by airliner was five times greater than by automobile. I'll be flying home. And the other part of that same system is that your chances of arriving unhurt are much greater in an airline than in a car because lots of car wrecks turn into accidents where people are only hurt not significant numbers killed. In October, not October, August of 1987, Northwest Airlines had an accident with a MD-82 aircraft. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. Okay. Now, did Republic Airlines merge with and become a part of Northwest Airlines. Yes, they did. And and with that I became a an employee of Northwest Airlines. Okay. Now taking the date that I picked where the accident occurred in 1987, could you briefly tell the uh, court what your jobs entailed with Northwest Airlines from basically from the date of that accident until you retired. Briefly, sir. I continued working uh, as in the avionics shop for Northwest Airlines until we uh, the airline acquired the 747, 400, and A320 aircraft. And as those aircraft were being introduced, I was promoted to director of technical training. And I ran technical training because of my avionics background. Uh, when I had the uh, training department fully running to handle a new aircraft, we, I had 42 instructors that reported to us, to me. Um, I did that until those aircraft were assimilated into the fleet, as I said, four years worth. And then I was uh, asked to be the uh, project director for a uh, flight entertainment system that included a, a uh, television system for all the uh, large aircraft, DC-10, 747s. So, and with that, I was the uh, project director for, uh, it was called World Link. System put up by Hughes Avicom, uh, Hughes Electronics. And I had that job uh, until we had got all the, uh, the large aircraft, when I say large aircraft, I'm talking about twin aisle aircraft uh, outfitted. Uh, then I was uh, made the, uh, I was a project director for in engineering for numerous configurations, uh, aircraft reconfigurations. Uh, the Air Northwest went through a, a period of buying used DC-10 or yeah, DC-10-30s, quite a number of them in fact, and. Uh, I was the project director to have them all reconfigured to a Northwest standards. And I was doing Understood. that. And I was, uh, I was still a project director when I left the airline in uh, 1997. And that was a retirement in 1997? 
Yes, I retired from the airline in 1997. Okay. Now, we picked the year uh, August of 1987, but it's true, isn't it, sir, that roughly January of 90, 1986, Northwest acquired Republic Airlines. That's a, an approximately a correct date, isn't it? That's correct. And that's the day you became, so to speak, the month that you became a Northwest employee, correct? Yes. Okay, now let's think about the Northwest Airline 255 crash. The merger of these two airlines was mostly accomplished when the crash of Northwest Airlines 255 occurred. Is that correct, or was the merger still ongoing? The merger for aircraft maintenance was uh, complete. The merger for the whole company, though, there were still uh, activities going on with the two pilot groups. Uh, and I'm not really familiar with the administration of the airline, how, how closely they had merged, but the aircraft maintenance department, we had merged a, the computer system where we kept track of log pages and all parts and uh, kept track of aircraft. And that was completed uh, before the uh, Flight 255 accident. Now, sir, on August 17, 1987, Northwest Flight 255, an MD-82 at Detroit, headed for Phoenix, Orange County, crashed on takeoff, killing 154 of the 155 people on board. That's a correct statement, is it not, sir? That is correct. The aircraft involved had been a Republic aircraft, November 312 Romeo Charlie, N312RC was the registration making up that flight, Northwest 255. That's correct, is it not, sir? Yes, it is correct. Okay. Now, how did you learn about that crash? The crash at Detroit uh, occurred, a crash of 255 occurred on a Sunday evening, and I was called that evening and asked to be uh, to take the first flight the next morning from Minneapolis to Detroit and to be there uh, to be part of the uh, investigation. And so uh, I heard about the, the crash um, rather, I'm not sure what the exact time was, but w within hours of it occurring on Sunday night, I was called and told to go to Detroit. And you acted as a Northwest representative to the investigation beginning um, that night then, sir, is that correct? That's right. I was assigned to the uh, NTSB systems group, and I was the Northwest, I was the only Northwest, Northwest member uh, on the systems group. Now, I'm going to ask you a question about what the NTSB investigation found. Sir, they found that the pilots had failed to place the flaps in the takeoff position. And it's true, is it not, that the flaps, by, by the investigation, the flaps were found in the zero or up position. Those are correct statements, is it not, sir? Yes, that's correct. You testified that it was the intent of Northwest Airlines to show evidence of the rewiring of the re remaining aircraft to show that the cause tow systems could be fixed so that the cause fail light would illuminate in the overhead enunciator panel 
any time the cause systems would become inoperative. That was what you've testified to. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. Okay. And you said your rewiring fix would illuminate a cause fail light for loss of power supply to number two when a broken wire interrupted the electricity or when there was a stuck air to ground switch in the nose or when the R25 relay stuck in the avionics uh, hell hole down below the cockpit. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. And were there some other single point failures as well, such as connectors or sh wires shorting out, that kind of thing? That's correct. Okay. Now, sir, have you read the affidavit of the Honorable Jim Burnett, who was the chairman of the NTSB during the Northwest 255 accident? Yes, I have read it. Have you read that? Yes, I have. And you, and you noticed that he, too, was disappointed to find that more than 20 years had gone by since his NTSB recommendations and that more than 20 years had gone by since McDonnell Douglas learned of a simple, cheap, and effective wiring of the MD-80 aircraft. Is that part of your testimony, sir? Yes, it is. We've done a lot of, like, for example, trucking accident cases, right? And when you hear this fact that, it, I don't know, 5,000 people a year are killed on the highway from 18-wheelers, right? Which is the equivalent of, I think, of 747 crashing every single week. Well, the 747, when it crashes, is bigger news. Absolutely. A trucking accident, that's why it's more difficult to implement and changes that protect the consumer than it is in the trucking industry, for example. A absolutely, when it happens one at a time, and we've uh, we've uh, obtained a number of corporate documents over the years in various cases where they do risk analysis, uh, they all know it's gonna cost a certain amount to fix a problem. And whether you're retrofitting an airplane or retrofitting a tower at a refinery, there's a cost involved. The downtime is a cost involved, while it's not operating, the loss of revenue, and then the cost of doing it itself. And they measure all of those, and then they factor those cost into this risk analysis. If we spend this much money, we're going to lose this much money while we're fixing it. What is the risk out there and how many people are at risk and what would it cost to have to pay for them? And the cost that they put on a person in this industry is for one individual, if one individual's at risk, the statistical deals that one person dies, they'll say the risk is we're going to assess that at a $5 million risk factor. If it's two people, it's not five men each. It starts being exponential. So we have two die because of the media attention and everything else. The overall risk factor, the brand name damage and everything is now 20. If 20 people die in a refinery explosion or something, now it's like 20 times more exponential. Instead of five million a person, it's 20 million a person because the attention's given to bad publicity. The bad publicity. And that's they factor that into the decision making. Like, how many people are we likely to kill? Well, first of all, if you're looking at multiple people getting killed, fix the problem. Yeah, yeah. Don't do the math anymore. Yeah. Fix the problem. Yeah. And that's not what happened here. Well, you're going to keep us updated, right? Yes, we are. Okay, I want to thank both of you for being on the show. Thank you. Good to see you again, Steve. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.